Good evening. And welcome to worship. Oops. Try that again. Good evening. <laughs> and welcome to worship as we gather in God's house on this Wednesday evening on our Lenten journey to once again give him honor and glory and praise. Privileged to be here tonight. I must mention to Pastor Kevin, I always like to get people involved when I do a service. Uh, none of my band folks are here tonight, so Pastor Kevin is going to uh, read the Lenten text, and we have a couple other readers to come in and help with this. And if anybody would like to sing a solo somewhere during the, the you, you just hold up your hand, that would be, that would really be good too. So are there any other announcements that need to be made? If not, I would ask Pastor Kevin to begin the service. Begin with our Lenten text this evening. Our Lenten text is from Mark 15, verses 1 through 15. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate asked Jesus again, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they had asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Thank you, Kevin. If you would please stand now as we responsively read the call to worship, taken from Psalm 25. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. He makes known to them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Let us pray. O Lord, our Maker, Redeemer, and Comforter, we are assembled in your presence to hear your holy word. We pray that you will open our hearts by the Holy Spirit, that through the preaching of your word we may be taught to repent of our sins, to believe on Jesus in life and in death, and to grow day by day in grace and holiness. Hear us for Christ's sake. Amen. If you please remain standing for our opening
wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. together confess our sins. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you for Christ's sake. Grant us forgiveness of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. If you would please be seated. Our first reading is found in the book of Joshua, chapter 24, verses 14 through 18. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity 
and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers up out from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight, and preserved us in all the way that we went, and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out because, and the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. Second reading is Colossians 3, verses 12 through 17. Put on them as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so that you also must forgive. And above all this, these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, so which, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing praise, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with the thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in the word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I would turn, change the order of service just a bit at this point. I would like to do the gospel uh, just before I begin the message, and then we'll do the response uh, at that time. So I would ask you to turn to page four as we share in our confession of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. Do you take offerings? Just, yeah. 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 Yeah.
but is your custom to be seated during the prayer? Or you usually sit or stand? Stand, okay. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we gather this Wednesday evening in our Lenten journey, we are reminded again of the awesome gift that you gave us, that gift of eternal life, that gift that was paid for with the blood of Jesus. As we sang in the hymn earlier on, nothing but the blood of Jesus can save us. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can bring us through the trials of this life into the world that God has prepared for us. And so we travel in this Lenten journey. Lord, help us to stay focused on those things eternal. The busyness of the world so often would draw us away and, and sometimes entangle and ensnare us in both body, mind, and soul. And, and we need to pull back. We need to take time. Take time to spend alone with you, O oh Lord, to remind us that there is much more to life than these few decades that we see here on earth. Give us boldness in our testimony of faith, Lord, that as Christians we would step out, step out of the walls of this church into our communities, into our schools, into our government and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was our commission. We were not told to, to make issues or make uh, comments or, or get involved in battles, but we were told to proclaim, to proclaim the good news of the gospel, that hearts might be won, one at a time, and brought into the fold of Jesus. We ask tonight that, Lord, you bless all these people in this congregation as they deal with the issues in their lives, be they health issues or relationship issues or whatever they might be. Help them to feel your presence as they deal with those things that they know that you truly are with them until the end of the age. As always, we ask, Lord, that you be with this nation. We have so many issues going on that you would continue to Seek to, to get into the hearts of our leaders that they might draw closer to you, that they might seek to find your guidance and leadership in decisions that are made in this nation. So critically that we find that relationship once again with you. We thank you, Lord, for the awesome weather that we have been having these last few days, and we thank you for the blessings that you continue to bring into our lives each and every day. In all these things we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. I would ask you to turn now to page 63 for our next hymn.
Said heading through the pulpit, but I'm kind of gimpy, and I didn't think I needed a head start tonight. So, if you would please stand for the reading of the gospel. Now, two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, they were crucified with him. And the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. And the soldiers mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed on him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do, not, do you not fear God, since you honor the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Please be seated. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we gather this evening to once again meditate and study on your word, we ask, Lord, that you open our hearts and our minds, that we would understand it, that we would receive it, that we would apply it to our lives, thereby becoming better, more willing servants. In your name we pray. Amen. <coughs> As I stepped up into this pulpit this evening, I thought, what an honor. This pulpit having served here for many decades, how many pastors, preachers, missionaries, other speakers have shared the gospel from this pulpit? How many souls are in heaven because of the words that were shared here? Sometimes we think small congregations can't make a difference. But in the big picture, they do. So continue to support your church and your pastor because they do make an amazing difference. It is a privilege again this year to be part of the Round Robin. And as you've figured out by now, our theme this year is Witnesses to the Crucifixion. And each of us had the opportunity to choose a uh, person who either observed or was part of the Passion Week. And the individual that I chose was a man who is identified in the Bible as a thief on the cross. But over the years, he has acquired the name of Saint Dismas. And Saint Dismas, at a very critical time in his life, made a choice. And that choice changed his eternity. 
just as each of us has the opportunity to make choices. I would take you to a document that you know and are very familiar, and I'll read the first paragraph, and it goes like this. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men were created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights among them, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That, of course, is the first part of the Declaration of Independence. And that was to be an experiment in government that had really never been tried before, where government would come from the bottom up. The people would make the choices. They would tell the leadership what to do. Well, over the years, that experiment has taken some beating, but it's still in place. But it really wasn't the first time that was tried to give the people the choice. We go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. It was God who gave the choice. He created Adam and Eve, and we see it in chapter 3. They're living in the garden, and everything is going really well, but they have a choice. God says, of this tree you shall not eat. Now, there were those who would say, well, why did God do that? If he wouldn't have given them a choice, they would have never fallen. But unless you have something to choose between, there is no benefit in having a choice. Some of you might remember back when Henry Ford was making the Model T, and he gave a choice in colors. It was either black or black. <laughs> so a choice of that is not really a choice. And so we know what happened to Adam and Eve. They had a choice, and they did not choose wisely. So we get to Genesis chapter 5, and we're seeing 10 generations from Adam to Noah. Not millions of years, 10 generations. And at chapter 6, God comes to Noah, and he says, I'm really sorry that I created mankind. His choice is always toward evil. And of all the people living on the planet at that time, there could have been millions, only eight chose to remain faithful to God. Think about that for just a minute. What if, what if this group of people in this congregation tonight were the only people who followed Jesus? What do you think our lives would be like when we step outside this door? Do you think other people would encourage us, cheer us on, tell us to be strong in our faith? Or you think they would laugh at us and mock us and ridicule? Noah and his family made a choice to honor God. That had to be a really hard thing in the time and place in which they lived. And when God came to Noah and told him what he was going to do, he could have said the word and the ark would have appeared. He could have said the word and the animals would have been in the ark. He could have said the word and it would have started raining right there. But God said to Noah, you're going to have to build this. And the bad news is electricity and hydraulics haven't been invented yet. So you're going to have to do it all by hand. It took him 120 years. And in all that time, Noah shared what was coming. And God gave the people a choice. And sad to say, they all chose death. We skip ahead to Genesis chapter 12, and there we see Abram. God comes to Abram and he says, I'm going to give you a choice. I would like you to leave the land of your father and go to a land that I will show you some 400 miles away. Take along all your stuff, and if you're willing to do that, your descendants will number the stars. Well, Abraham and Sarah were probably 60, 70 years old at the time and had no children. So that was a pretty alluring promise. And so they made the choice to follow God, and they get to the new place, and they're there for 25 years, and they're still waiting. It's not always easy when we make a choice to follow God. Everything is not always roses. Sometimes there's crosses to bear. But finally, the son of promise is born, 
and he's eight or ten years old, and God comes to Abraham and says, I want you to take him to a mountain where I will show you and offer him as a sacrifice. Abraham had a choice. That would have been a hard one. I don't know that I would have done very well. But at this point, Abraham is rooted so deep in his faith in God that whatever God asked him, Abraham did. And of course, God spared the boy and honored Abraham. He made a good choice. I would take you to 2 Samuel chapter 11. Here we see King David. And most all of you know the king history of King David. He was taken as a shepherd boy out of the pasture and brought to be the greatest king in Israel's history. Under his leadership, the 12 tribes came back together. Israel had the most territory it has ever had before or since. And most of Israel's enemies were defeated. He was at the height of his kingship. And he had an army out still doing battle, probably should have been there with them, but instead he was in Jerusalem. It was a warm spring evening. He was in the balcony of the palace, looking out over the city. And as he was looking accidentally, he saw a beautiful woman taking a bath. The first look was accidental. The second look was by choice. And that choice led to adultery, to murder, to the death of a child. Eventually, David confesses, God forgives and restores him, but the consequences of that choice stayed with David all his life. Choices matter. I would take you to Daniel chapter 3. And here we see a very egotistical, egotistical man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. He's the king of Babylon. Most powerful man on the earth at that time. And he decides that he's going to build a statue some 90 feet tall out on the plain of Dora. And his plan is when the statue is done, whenever music is played, everybody bows down and worships his statue. So the statue is done. The day of dedication is held. The band plays. There's thousands of people all around, and they all fall flat on the ground. Well, Nebuchadnezzar had a few spies in the crowd just to check to make sure everybody was bowing. And one of them came running to Nebuchadnezzar and said, Those three Hebrew boys whom you have given positions of power in your government did not bow. They made a choice. It had to be really hard because the punishment for not bowing down was to be thrown into the furnace. So Nebuchadnezzar has them brought and he says, well, maybe you guys didn't understand. See, here's how this works. The music plays, you bow down. If you don't, you fry in the furnace. And one of the young men said to Nebuchadnezzar, we bow only to the true God of Israel. Our God can deliver us from your furnace, but even if he doesn't, we will not bow down. They made a choice. Think of the world in which we live today and how much pressure there is for us as Christians to bow down, to give just a little. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not bow, and God delivered them. We go now to the New Testament, and there we see a young woman by the name of Mary. We've never heard of her until Luke chapter 1. An angel comes to Mary and proposes the assignment that God is going to give her. This was not an easy thing. Mary understood how well it goes for women in her day who become pregnant and don't have husbands. Taking this on was like risking her very life. And yet Mary submitted to God's will. She made a choice. 
as we go through the pages of the New Testament, we see the 12 apostles. One by one walk away from their professions, making a choice to follow Jesus. And we know from history, 11 of those 12 were martyred for their faith. We come a little bit further into the New Testament, and we see in the Gospel of John, one of the high priests, a very, very powerful man by the name of Nicodemus, comes to Jesus at night. He knows that his colleagues would really give him a bad time if they knew, but he made a choice. He was willing to risk that all. He had to know more about Jesus. And as he and Jesus have that discussion about being born again, Nicodemus is totally confused. And we wonder what happened. Did Nicodemus make the right choice? But we see on the end, as Jesus is taken down from the cross, Nicodemus is there to help with the burial, making the right choice. We see now Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's praying, Father, cannot this cup pass from me? Jesus had the power. He could have made the choice not to. But I don't know that it ever even entered his mind. He was so committed to doing the Father's will. And his love for us was so great that I don't think in his mind it really was a choice. The next morning early we see Jesus taken to the court of Pilate. Pilate had a choice. He could have let Jesus go in every instinct that he had, told him he should. But in the end, he caved and had Jesus crucified. We're now out at Calvary. It's about 9 o'clock in the morning. And we see Jesus and the two thieves nailed to the cross. Just listening to that, almost sends goosebumps up my neck, nailed to the cross. Can you imagine taking big spikes and driving them through flesh and then hanging on those nails and during that crucifixion? So it was. And it's now about 12 o'clock, and they've been on the cross for about three hours, and the one thief looks over at Jesus and says, If you're the Christ... Free yourselves, and while you're at it, free us too. Jesus doesn't respond, but the other thief does. Have you no regard? Have you no respect? We're getting what we deserve. This man has done nothing. And then he turns to Jesus, and he says, Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. He made a choice. And I think what happens next, in my mind, is one of the most powerful moments in all of the New Testament. Jesus is hanging on the cross, enduring all of the physical agony of a crucifixion. And on top of that, God has piled on him all the sin of all time. And he's dealing with all that. And when this thief turned to him, he could have said, well, you know what, I'm really busy right now. You had all your life to repent. Sorry, too late. But that's not the Jesus you and I know. He turned to that man and he said, Today, today you will be with me in paradise. In that moment we see two things that I think are all important. We see first of all that... Jesus is never, ever too busy to hear from any one of us at any time. You'll never, ever get a business signal when you turn to Jesus. He'll always welcome you with open arms. The other thing we see in that statement, it is Jesus who has the authority to grant anyone eternal life. So there we have it. Lots of choices were made in the Bible, some good, some not so good. 
So what about our lives? We make lots of choices every day. Maybe the first thing we get up in the morning, we got to decide which pair of socks we're going to put up. Maybe at night, we got to decide if we're going to eat a bowl of ice cream or not. Pretty routine choices. But we make some important choices. Choices like who our spouse will be, choices like what our occupation will be, where we live. A lot of important choices. But I would share with you tonight, just as it was with St. Dismas, the one choice that you make in regard to Jesus is the all-important choice of your life. Do you accept Jesus to be your Lord and Savior? Do you believe that you are a sinner and that you need a Savior? That's the biggest choice you will make in your life. Many of you here, I hope, have made that choice. And as a believer and follower, now we now have been commissioned to go out and share that news. We had a missionary few weeks back at our church in trip and he commented he was in Uganda for 17 years and he said you know you don't have to go to Uganda to be a missionary he said we have missionaries coming back to the United States and saying what's the matter don't you people read your Bibles anymore the mission field is all around us it's in our family it's in our community it's in our school and God can bring us opportunity to testify to that faith that we know is real and makes a difference in lives in this world and in the next. And so I encourage you, be bold in your choices. Be strong in your faith. And continue to build that relationship with Jesus Christ, your Savior. Let's close in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you. We thank you tonight again for the awesome gift of eternal life. These few days of trouble in this world will soon be behind us, and there will be a glorious future that will be there forever, given to us as a gift from you. We pray this in your name. I would invite you to turn to your hymnal again for our closing hymn, The Old Rugged Cross.
together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> 